you go to a speaking engagement and all the photos are taken and there's uh, video clips of you. People ask for your presentation. They give business cards. But what do you do next? Sometimes you're on to your next speaking engagement. And maybe at your agency, if you don't have a team of people who can continue with the lead gen, but I would say it's really important for the speaker mm -hmm. to make the connection with the people in the room and to do the follow-up. Hey everybody, today I am so excited to be joined by Deirdre Breckenridge. And Deirdre is the CEO of Pure Performance Communications. She's a seven time published business book author, a marketing strategist, and a communications trainer. She helps professionals just like you and me unlock their most compelling stories, lead pressing media conversations, and create influence and impact in the marketplace. Deirdre, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brooke. Great to be here. So excited to talk to you. So I have to give a little backstory. We actually know each other from a charity that we both are involved with called Best Buddies. And Best Buddies helps individuals with IDD. And we met through this amazing organization and became fast friends. And then as soon as I found out that she was a communications expert, I was like, oh. <laughs> So I've been lucky enough to like send talks and, and little pieces of communication over her way. And she's given me some tips on my own, you know, stance and things like that during speaking. So I know that the audience is going to be so excited to hear what you have to say today, because don't we all want to be on stage? Well, thank you. And yes, I think we do. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly do. But before we get into all of that, first question first, always the first one. What made you start your own business? Like what made you get into this whole thing? Well, I guess I got bit by the entrepreneurial bug because I always thought that I would be running somebody else's agency. And at one point I was, and I realized, wait a second, if my boss, the owner of the agency can say, and this is a Jersey thing, Brooke, you know this, I'm going down the shore mm -hmm. Memorial Day and I'll be back after Labor Day, you're in charge. Let me know if you need anything. If I could do that for him, I could run my own business. And I shocked my family because they didn't think that I would be an entrepreneur. No one in the family was an entrepreneur, but I did it and never looked back. Ugh, and you're so good at what you do. So tell everybody really quickly, like who do you help with all of the communications things that you do? Like, are, is it people like me? Is it other people? Like who are the people who you serve? It's people like you. I have served agency owners. I've served coaches who serve agency owners. And I work with business leaders in different industries, whether it's healthcare, it's broadcast. Uh, I found a happy place in private credit and private equity, so financial services. And it's really doing the deep work as a speaker and getting yourself out there. So I want to kind of play this from my, my point of view, right? An agency owner's point of view. Um, Agency owners are obviously, we're brave, right? We're brave or crazy or both. Uh, we go out there, we decide to do this thing. And then all of a sudden, at least in the marketing world, we start to see that other people like us are speaking on stage. And some of them are speaking on stage a lot. So what would you say, how do you feel like it's, it's um, what do you feel like the best way is to make that transition from being an agency owner or anybody that you work with really to becoming a speaker on stage? Like what should prompt that shift? And I know you speak a lot too. So for your own self, how did that contribute to what you do? So I think the, the shift happens from within. For all your experience as an agency owner, I just know I got to a certain point when I wanted to share the great work and to help others. And for me, it was realizing that maybe I wasn't going to be on a national stage at that very minute. However, that was okay. I never put a time frame or a limit. I looked at local and regional opportunities that turned into moving to a national stage, going through association. So any connections that I had, which turned into international, which also turned into training within companies, so don't limit yourself, but at the same time, no, sometimes you might start on a smaller scale and that's okay. 
Right. So what I hear you saying is have patience, right? Like how yes. long would you say on average, right? Let's just give an average of all of the people who you've worked with. What is that average time frame that you see between, you know, not really speaking at all, but wanting to and actually get starting to get invited to speak on stage? That's a tough question because everybody is different. And sometimes there are stories that happen that get you on stage more quickly than Mm -hmm. other stories. There's also things that you can do to help you get to the stage. For example, writing a book. (laughs) My first book led to a ton of speaking engagements. We're talking back in 1999, I think my first book came out from Prentice Hall was my publisher back then. So it really depends if you don't have a book, but you have an agency and you're doing great work you just need the practice. You need the forum. It could be anywhere from a month to a quarter and you're out there. Mm -hmm. Go for it. That's what I would say. I couldn't agree more because I had dabbled in speaking um, before I published my book. And then as soon as the book got published, all of a sudden it became much easier to get on stage. And I know I was just talking with Carlin, um, who is has done a show with us so go check hers out um carlin ancrum she was saying do you feel like the book was kind of the catalyst for all of the speaking and i said honestly yeah like i i'm sorry that that's the answer because i know it's not easy to publish a book and write a book but it just lends a certain amount of credibility to your name and your reputation and the experience that you have and then people are like oh I feel comfortable hiring this person, right? (laughs) Yes, that's true. As an agency owner, when I wrote my first book, I remember that I used to, I looked young back in the day and I would go into the boardroom with my two partners who also were young entrepreneurs and they would look at us and say, where are the executives? But as soon as I wrote a book or had books, I would walk into the boardroom, put the book on the table or a series of my books and right away that's instant credibility mm-hmm. so it did it, it helped in a number of ways from stage to boardroom pitches wherever you go so let's talk about the unique skill set it takes to be a speaker um because you know not everyone possesses the skills or this is how okay this is my opinion because deirdre might say she thinks differently so let's have this open dialogue what I think, you know, some people just aren't built for speaking, right? And some people are. But can you tell us how to prepare? Like what's important about preparing and how do you deliver a compelling um, presentation or speech? And how do you make sure that you're resonating with your audience effectively? Um, Which sounds like a lot, but these are all skills that you have to develop to be a good speaker. So let's start there. Like can everybody be a good speaker or is it really left to a certain skill set? Well, as a as an executive trainer and coach, I would say there's three things that have to happen. You can have the greatest story, but if you can't talk about it and create impact or have somebody want to do something, participate with you, work with you, then it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Going on stage means you have to be in full alignment. So the practice work comes from aligning your vocal cues, your verbal cues, and your nonverbal cues. Now that's covering everything. When your voice sounds right, when you're using the right words, and when your body is congruent with your voice and your words, that's the point where people start paying attention. Mm. That's the point when they tune in, you're in flow, you're in your communications flow, they want more, and you will create impact. So that's the deep alignment work that has to be done. I like to say that you can show up with your talking points, you may have executive presence, but if you don't do that deep work, you're not going to have people engage with you in a meaningful way. Interesting. And so before in the green room, before we jumped on and hit record, we were talking about uh, a show that I spoke at a few weeks ago, Inbound. Uh, I went and spoke there and I was nervous because Inbound's a big event. You know, they have very well-known speakers. And uh, well, I always get nervous, by the way, before I go speak. So for those of you listening, that's it's normal. normal. <laughs> yeah. Very normal. It's totally normal. But I was telling Deirdre that Bianca Dramatica, who's my other persona, like 
took over during the speech. She was joking. She was having the whole room laughing. I ended up scoring like a 4.95 out of five for my session, which is, I think, the highest I've ever scored. But it, I felt like it wasn't me. It was Bianca Dramatica. And you said something industry, interesting about that. So t- tell the audience what you kind of told me when I told you about my persona. I shared that Bianca is always a part of you. She's there. It's just when you're not aligned in full alignment, voice, vocal, verbal, and nonverbal cues, she can't come out. Mm -hmm. And she's the not nervous part of you. She's the part of you that flows. She feels comfortable and confident. And it shows in everything that you do. But Bianca never leaves you. It's just you're in other situations that make you nervous or they could be stressful. And she can't really come out if you're not practicing your alignment. Awesome. Well, so let's talk about it a little bit more because, you know, Beyonce, if you are a fan of Beyonce's, as I am, she says that she brings her stage persona as Sasha Fierce, right? And one of my friends, Katie, Katie, hi. She's also been on the show. Her stage uh, persona name is, I think, Savannah Shenanigans. So (laughs) (laughs) are these helpful in the work that you do with your client, do you help them kind of build that persona or do you say, no, it's really just you, Brooke. It's not Bianca. Like, tell me, like, do we get to make up these uh, stage names? Should we have them or are they crutches? No, I think you should have them. Whatever works for you. That's the thing. You're turning nervous energy or whatever that adrenaline is into something positive. So yes, if Bianca works for you, Sasha fears for Beyonce, I say go with it. Because it, it is just a natural part of you that's coming out. You're, you're letting it out. And it feels good. As long as it feels good, that's what matters. Oh, yeah. Like, I would like to change my name to Bianca and be her all the time. But, uh, <laughs> but I don't know if that's possible. Uh, let's talk about the benefits of speaking a little bit. Because I know that one of the big things that you do, and, and part of how you're so well-known, at least in the marketing community, is through the LinkedIn courses that you have. And that's a really hard niche to get into, right? I'm sure we would all love to produce LinkedIn courses, but they're very choosy about who they work with. So how did you identify that opportunity or did they find you? And then what advice would you give to anyone who's listening who maybe is currently a speaker or wants to be a speaker? And how do you turn um, being a speaker into other opportunities? So for the LinkedIn, it wasn't LinkedIn when I started, it was lynda.com. And I was out there on social media. I think I had already written uh, public relations and social media, eight practices, and they approached me. And I didn't even know who lynda.com was. I had to go to my husband and say, have you ever heard of this? And he was so excited because it was, uh, Linda was more about IT and Mm -hmm. IT professionals and training, but they were opening up the marketing end of what they did. Linda was acquired by LinkedIn. And I would just say that it is a wonderful opportunity. What I always have done with my, whether it's my LinkedIn courses or my books, is just to listen. Now, back in the day, listening meant you would be at a networking event or speaking with your colleagues and peers, tuning into their pain points. Today, we can use social media, and Brooke, you know this, the social media intelligence is powerful to understand the pain points and what people need you to answer. That's all I've ever done with my books and my courses is just answering and helping and then looking at the fringe of what's out there to say, they're touching on this. I'm going to trust my gut. I'm going to move in this direction, push the envelope, and that becomes a course, that becomes a, a book, it becomes a, a product. For example, we just launched an artificial facial expression tool that reads 98 effects on your face. Oh it's an gosh. AI web-based tool that we're now beta testing at Pure Performance. So just pushing that envelope because I was listening to people talk about body language, I'm a certified body language professional, but those micro expressions in the face just touched upon. So I okay. I have to hear more about this. We have to we have to take take a little left turn here because AI hugely popular. Everybody's talking about it. If you haven't heard everybody talking about it, 
you must just live under a rock somewhere because I feel like it's all the rage. So I need to know more about this. It's a tool that reads those microaggressions. My, micro expressions on your face. Aggressions. <laughs> Emotions. You wanna, yeah. yeah I'll, you can beta test the tool. If you like, you go on. And what happens is the, the camera is watching you. AI is looking at the major emotions. What, what's your dominant emotion, which could be happy, disgust, anger, surprise, sadness. And what ends up happening is it'll read you as you're speaking. Then it breaks it down into four quadrants. As you're talking, this little ball moves around from quadrant to quadrant. And the benefit is to say, I'm sharing information. I, I'm practicing for a presentation. You can go on and record yourself and watch the playback. You're practicing your presentation. AI reads you. Are you do you really feel the words? In other words, are you saying how wonderful something is but AI is reading it, you're in the obstructive zone. You're stressed out over it. You're suspicious. You're not trusting. Or you're really in the high power zone where you're feeling the, the ambition, the determination, the happiness and joy that you're expressing. And it's fascinating to see where you land when you're speaking, because sometimes it just proves the point. Your words are saying one thing, but your face is saying another, and that's what people perceive. Oh my gosh, this is the coolest thing ever. So, so can anyone beta test this right now? Right or now. Can yes. anyone, right now, yeah? Yes. Where right do they now. go to do this? Like get in touch with you? Go to. So website. I'd have to share the link. It's okay. a special link. But if, if somebody is interested, you can go to my LinkedIn newsletter. It's called The Influential Communicator. My latest post talks about curiosity in the face. And as a bonus, it asks if anybody wants to beta test. Oh my gosh, I'm totally going to do that. We'll make sure and we link to everything in the in the show notes on YouTube under the show so you can just link right over. But okay, thank a, you for that. Little, you're welcome. Yeah. Here's a little tip, just a micro expression. Sometimes when you share something with anyone, it could be a family member, colleague, a peer, if they're really happy for you, they'll have a, an immediate congruent smile. So both sides of the, the face will go up, the cheeks will puff, there'll be little check marks in the eyes. But if they're not happy for you, within a split second will be an incongruent smile and then a real smile. You can actually tell if somebody's happy for you. Wow. Incredible. Okay. I'm so excited. We're going to have to just have a whole other show about the AI topic because this is way too cool. But getting cool. back to those of us who want to speak, I think yes. storytelling is a word that we hear all the time and it is very powerful. But how do you work with your clients to incorporate storytelling into their speaking engagements? Um, or how do you use them in your own speaking engagements or LinkedIn course? courses. And what is the goal for that storytelling? Is it to tie into the content or is it to make an impact? Well, first off, you have to have a framework. So I use a framework that I've developed over the years. And you have to decide at the end of the framework with your call to action, what you want the outcome to be. But the framework starts with you're going to frame that big idea. And a big idea could be the, it could be a product launch. It could be this big concept that you've created. It, it can be anything that you wanna to bring to your audience, but you have to know what's the appeal. Is it right. ethos, pathos, or logos? What's the hook and how well do you know them? So you can get to, okay, now I'm gonna deliver this information by painting a really vivid picture and how your most important messaging stands on a bench. And I could explain the whole benchmark bench theory and how to break down your messages so people actually care. Then you get to that big aha moment. They reimagine themselves. So you always have to make them the hero in the story to get to what is the call to action as you drive the conf confidence and you want them to participate with you. So there is a framework that you can use. I love that. And let's talk about storytelling from a personal side, because a lot of speakers will come up and tell 
this really personal story. Think of like the TED Talks, mm-hmm. right? It's like a very personal anecdote that happens, but they tie it back into whatever the subject matter is. What's your take on the personal anecdotes and then kind of tying it into you know, the professional speaking setting? Because sometimes I feel like it works beautifully, but when it doesn't work, it's, it's really noticeable. It falls flat. Mm-hmm. Well, I do think that the personal human side of you is very important and the stories have to resonate. There's something about understanding. You have a story that you want to share and you're extremely passionate about it. It's, it's your why, Simon Sinek right? Mm -hmm. That's your Mm -hmm. why. But you still have to match that to the passion potential of the people that you're speaking with. And it's at that intersection of what they care about and what you so passionately care about. That's your opportunity right there, Mm -hmm. passion potential, to be able to tie it into what is whatever you're offering, whatever they need to know that they're then going to hook onto and say, yes, this is me. I think what a mistake is, if you keep it all about yourself and then do a tie in to something you want to share, you're leaving out the passion potential and Mm -hmm. no one will come along with you. Yeah, I think that's superb advice. So let's talk about lead generation, because if we're being honest, you know, I'll, I'll start, you know, hi, my name is Brooke Sellis and I'm about to be honest about something when it comes to speaking. I like speaking because it's lead it's lead generation, right? Like this is how people get to know our brand. It's um, actually how we've closed some of our biggest clients. So can you help us or walk us through lead generation speaking tactics and what's worked best for both you and your clients when it comes to using speaking as a platform for lead generation? You automatically have warm leads in the room or on Zoom or wherever you're having your meeting, whether it's on video or in person. You're vetted by the agency, by a company that brings you in. And it's taking what happens after not for granted. And I think sometimes that's where in my younger years, I will be fully transparent. I fell short too. You go to a speaking engagement and all the photos are taken and there's uh, video clips of you. People ask for your presentation. They give business cards. But what do you do next? Sometimes you're on to your next speaking engagement. And maybe at your agency, if you don't have a team of people who can continue with the lead gen. But I would say it's really important for the speaker mm-hmm. to make the connection with the people in the room and to do the follow-up. I find that on LinkedIn, it's easier to do the speaking, to create the invite. It's a lead generation tool in the sense that once you create the, the invite on LinkedIn, you have your comments there. You Anybody who signs up, you can speak to them afterward. If they didn't come, you can share the video, you can share follow-up materials. That helps so that you can get to the conversation that gets to the handshake. And whether that's another speaking engagement, an interview, business, that's all to be determined. But it's the follow-up. Yeah, I love that you said that. So after inbound, one of the things that I did, everybody saw my slides, right, during the talk. And inbound includes the slides from all of the presenters in their app. They also, for deep dive workshops, which is what I did, include the the workshop piece, like some sort of PDF inside of the app. Um, but what I found right away when I was talking about the PDF that was in the app for the workshop, people didn't really know what I was talking about. So mm-hmm. I said, I will get everybody's information and I will send uh, the slides, which, by the way, these are updated from the ones that Inbound had. And I did. I had updated a stat on one of the slides. And I'll also make sure I send you the PDF of the workbook. And a ton of people gave me their cards because they wanted that follow up. And I use that as a way not only to follow up and do what I said I was going to do, but also just keep top of mind with those people, right? Yes. I'm immediately connecting with them after the event, putting myself back into their thoughts, right? And then obviously from there, hopefully I'll be able to ga- engage with them throughout some of my other, you know, marketing initiatives that I have going on. So what do you think about 
like a leave behind or a follow up or what's your best advice there for like maintaining that connection after the event is over? Leave behind? Yes. Follow up? Definitely. And figure out a way that you can follow up and have them sign up for your newsletter or agree to your email updates. There's going to be more information. Get them over to your LinkedIn newsletter so that they can always hear whatever it is you're writing about. There's always a next step and a way to to get them to opt in. They might not be ready to work with you right away, but just what you said, Brooke, staying top of mind. And that's where lead generation, whether you're using active campaign or you're using your LinkedIn network to do that, that's important. Let's talk about personal brand, another really hot topic. Um, you know, and there's a discussion that happens a lot about um, professional and personal brand. And so the argument is that even though B Squared Media is my brand, Brooke Sellis has her own personal brand, right? So companies aren't coming and necessarily asking B Squared Media to speak on stage. It's Brooke who they're asking, or it's um, if I when I'm teaching courses, right? They're hiring Brooke. They're not necessarily hiring B Squared Media. So, what is your opinion on personal branding and how intertwined does it need to be, or should it be, with your agency or your company's brand? I think it is intertwined. B Squared Media gets the benefit of you, Brooke, as the expert. If you have the credibility, if you build your personal brand and you show up and people know what you stand for and you have a good reputation and you're aligned with other credible uh, colleagues and brands, guess what? Your company automatically benefits. It, it's a part of you, especially as the owner of yeah. your company. So I say, yes, the personal brand is important. And just remember, it takes, it can take a while to build the personal brand. It can take seconds to knock it down. <laughs> yeah. And it's important to pay attention to who you're aligning with and what you're sharing, especially out there on social media, <laughs> things can bubble up quickly. What about some of the executives who may, maybe you've helped with speaking or communications? Um, let's say that they are personally maybe very different from the brand, the corporate brand, right? Maybe the corporate brand is very traditional, mm -hmm. very conservative, and the executive that you're working with on a personal brand level is very um, not, they're not conservative. They're very open. They're very like loud and boisterous, but lots of energy. What do you tell a person like that when they are speaking, representing that brand? Do they have to tone that down or does it just become part of the larger brand or how does that work? Oh, I think that a lot of what they're, if they're completely different than their brand, the speaking that they're doing is going to have a disclaimer that <laughs> says, these are my opinions and not the opinions of my company, because there would be a split. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't see a really conservative brand being super happy about somebody who is the complete opposite. If you're in a regulated industry, oh, you're yeah. going to have to tone that down. And, and you will, <laughs> because whether it's uh, financial services, pharmaceuticals, healthcare, you, you have to be careful. So I would just say that preempt with these are my own opinions and not that of my company, but you never want to hurt your company. Right. Sure. So when it comes to knowing how you're doing, right? Measuring su success is important for everyone, but especially for marketing agency owners. And obviously if we're using speaking as a platform for lead generation, what would you suggest we do if we want to understand if we are being successful? Um, are there any metrics or things in particular that you look at to gauge whether or not you did a good job or your clients did a good job and how can we use those metrics as well? Um, and, and how does all of that tie into, or does it, agency growth? Well, it definitely ties to the growth. I say the metrics are you set your goals on a certain number of speaking engagements. How does that convert, number one? What's the quality of the engagement and the quality of the audience? 
What kind of, and let's not ignore the qualitative feedback. What are people saying? What yeah. are they saying in the exit surveys? You got a great score at inbound, right? That mm -hmm. says something. Mm -hmm. What's the chatter on social media about you, your company and speaking? That's a, a way to take a look at how you're doing with your speaking. It's also the conversion to whatever you want to happen. More speaking engagements. Do I get clients from this? How many people come out of a, a, an engagement and then sign up for my yeah. newsletters? There's yeah. ways to track it. Did I drive more traffic to my website? What did they do? So if you were, uh, it's hard to say uh, where people came in from, but let's face it, if you're speaking at a conference and you're doing a lot of promotion, they might come in from a link that you share to your website during the time frame. It's making all those pieces connect so you can say, okay, I see the, the difference. We're moving the needle. And oh, by the way, I've got three more speaking engagements lined up for this quarter. Yeah, I love that. They And I will say Inbound did give... Um, feedback. They gave me some of the comments too. So they didn't just share the That's score, great. they shared the feedback, which was really helpful. It was all great feedback, which is wonderful. I'm not complaining at all, but I will say I really appreciate the negative, even more so than the positive, just because I want to know how, how to improve, right? So um, if you are at an event, I think my um, appeal to you would be leave leave comments. When they ask you to fill out those speaker evaluations, do it because you are helping people like me and Deirdre and her clients yes. and everyone else who's up there become better at their craft. We, we want to be the best we can be. And the positive is wonderful. Obviously, we love those. Keep those coming. But I think the negative is really where we start to understand like how we can improve. I know I talk really fast. So, you know, someone, if someone put in a comment, like loved her, but she talked too fast, I would actually really appreciate that because it, it tells me something I'm already working on. It's something I already need to know, but now I'm hearing it from someone else. So I love that. And I love that you said measuring traffic. One of the things I did in my inbound talk, which I've never done before, is I had a QR code on one of the slides. And I said, you know, if you're interested in this subject, I talk about it. That's the only thing I talk about in my newsletter. You can sign up here. And obviously, we saw a huge spike in traffic that that yes. day to that landing page with the newsletter. And that was one way to tell me, OK, people are interested in this, even though the talk was fun or whatever. They actually care about this conversation. So I think those are, are great tips and ways to measure performance and how you're doing. Yes. And you are truly passionate about this because I can see you touched your heart <laughs> as you spoke and your hands were flowing and that's all good. And I agree. The negative yeah. is the most helpful. And when somebody takes the time to, I won't call it negative feedback, but to give the critique, you should thank them and yes. ask more questions about it and take it to heart and see if it does need to change it. Sometimes I feel that there's sensitivities. People aren't coming at it from a place of I'm trying to harm you. It's mm -hmm. I do want to help and I enjoyed what you said, but here's how to make it better. I have to say, this is the other fun thing about being friends with Deirdre is because she's a communications expert and she knows everything about body language. Whenever you're talking to her and any little like, movement you make, she's like, oh, well, there's that me, shoulder. <laughs> tell me more about that shoulder. <laughs> so, so that's it's always, always really a fun. It, it's, it's always yeah. a, it has to happen in clusters. One lone body language movement won't mean anything. But when you see different things happening, I always say it's comfort versus discomfort. And when there's discomfort, I just ask, what's going on? How are you feeling? And you just have to think about it yourself. You don't have to share it with me or anyone, but it's really a good exercise in understanding yourself. But here's the good news. You can understand yourself and the way you come across with all your body language you can then start reading the room a lot better. And that also creates more impact for you. Yes. I really can't wait to test out your tool. It's going to be so oh, much cool. fun. Thank All right. You. So let's talk about the scary part because um, 
I had someone just this morning on LinkedIn say something like, oh, I never would have known you were a nervous speaker. And I'm like, not kidding you. You can ask some of my friends. Uh, several years ago, Rich Brooks allowed me graciously to come speak at his event. And my voice was literally shaking when I got up in, in front of the room at first. Mm -hmm. So it's intimidating. And I still mm -hmm. get like the shakes and the nauseous and the butterflies and all those things right before I go on stage. And then hopefully Bianca comes in and takes over for me. <laughs> but what are tips or techniques that you can give me and anyone else who gets like that, the jitters before they go on stage to overcome that nervousness and, you know, just come into themselves, into the alignment mm -hmm. that you talked about and deliver the best presentation they can? I would say to pay attention to your breathing. And breathing takes practice. I do a quick 30 second test with executives where you put your hand on your chest, hand on your stomach, and for 30 seconds, you just breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth a little more deeply than you normally would, but don't hyperventilate. <laughs> and after 30 seconds, I ask a simple question, which hand move more? And if they say the hand on their chest, then I let them know that's thoracic breathing. And we do, we breathe in our chest, but the problem is when you go out on stage and you're nervous, if you're breathing in your chest, you start yes. then it goes up into your throat yes. and you're not able to speak as well. The sound of your voice is not rich. Voices go higher. There's all kinds of mouth clicking and sounds. If you can practice diaphragm breathing and belly breathing, and that's when your hand is moving with your stomach, that's the best kind of breathing pos possible. So I usually start with the breathing techniques we get into self-hypnosis, we do visualization, reflexology of the hands, desk yoga. All of these techniques really help because it helps your brain. And when your brain is calm and you're in the front of your brain, your rational thinking center, well, guess what? You're gonna be able to access anything you need at that moment. The minute you feel overwhelmed and stressed and the nerves, you feel when you go on stage, you might slip into your limbic system. Mm -hmm. And when the emotional brain, the emotional center, the amygdala takes over, that's tough. You can't find your words. There's a lot of filler words. You're not breathing properly. Your body's doing all kinds of things. Breathing, that's my biggest tip. Pay attention to your breathing. And there's so much more I could share about this, but if you can get the belly breathing, and do that before your speaking engagements, that will help. I just have to say belly breathing is such a big deal because now you've said it, my horse trainer when I'm horseback riding says it, and my uh, hey. chiropractor says how important belly breathing is. So I think belly breathing yes. might just be like a, a life tip, honestly. Like if you I can think conquer that, you can do anything. Yes. <laughs> you can do anything. And then you can get into, if you can do the belly breathing and there's counting exercises, if you can keep the thoughts out, you're on the road to meditation. Yeah. And meditation is really something that I practice every day, every morning. It helps me to show up with my full alignment. And it all starts with breathing. <laughs> I love that. Okay. One quick question about hands. Sure. I'm a very handsy talker. You know this about yeah. me. What is your feeling on handsy talkers? Like, is that good? Is it bad? Should we tone it down? Should we just let it fly? You want to let your hands fly because that's a natural place where energy comes out. The best speakers are fluid. Their fingers are open. This says calm. You're in the truth plane between your chin and your waist. This is a great place to be. Not mercy hands. That's please help me. <laughs> that's not necessarily a good look. Sometimes you go up into a higher plane, which is more exaggerated and that's okay. However, if you stay up here all the time, people might not believe that, well, are you always this exaggerated? I think hands are best when they're open, there's space between your arms and they're in the truth plane. Keeping your hands low, not a good look. That's when we move more into protection, covering. It's much better to keep your hands in the truth plane. So that's my take on hands. Don't, I wouldn't, don't stop your hands. If you, if you do this, the energy is going to move out through your shoulders and your head. And you don't want to do that. Not a good look. Okay. So I heard you say, Brooke, go with the hands. 
go with the I'm hands. Keep going with the hands. Yes, go go with the hands. Make sure they're not too high all the time, not low. You're you're in the truth plane. Oh, Sometimes okay. you go up here, but that's okay. Yeah, because that's yeah. excitement. <laughs> yeah. I get excited that's too joy, often. <laughs> yeah, that is my joy. Um, okay, let's talk about the first step that often happens, at least in marketing a lot with speaking, which is speaker applications and your mm -hmm. speaking abstract. Are there any tips or strategies that you have there um, for turning in abstracts or applications that get noticed and convey you to that other person on the other side of the screen who's just reading a piece of paper about you? So anything that's getting noticed, I would say deserves an area, build it out. Maybe it's on your website, have a little speakers bureau of your own where you house your abstracts, where you're speaking, photos of you, presentations if you wanna share. Be serious about those topics and then let people know that they can find them and find more information. So that's number one. It's one thing to say, I am a speaker, but it's another to show that you're mm -hmm. a speaker and make sure that your speaking is appearing through social media. You are the speaker, you're being the speaker, you're sharing the videos and ways that you're out there. And as far as the abstracts go, I noticed that early back in the day, I was filling out a lot of abstracts. It flips all of yeah. a sudden, it's coming to you. When you start showing that you're speaking, just being, people start inquiring. They need a place to do that. So have that speakers button. So it's <laughs> almost click here, book, book, Brooke now. <laughs> book, Brooke. And that's what it says on the site, book, Brooke. Yeah, which is a exactly. tongue twister. Very So important. one last question that I think is a little more on the challenging side here, but like, how do you get up on stage and share your secrets without giving away the kitchen sink, right? Like everything but the kitchen sink, that whole cliche saying, how do you strike that balance between providing real value to the audience so that they do want to connect with you and you do get more speaking gigs, but you also want to keep that competitive edge, right? So what's your tip there? Is it like just let the advice fly or do you hold a certain amount of it back so that there's like a sense of mystery or urgency for the audience to connect with you? I mean, I guess there is a sense of mystery. There's always, you can give a framework, you can share a process, but that's not me. That's not my coaching. Right. That's not going deep. And it's remembering that if it's just a process or just a framework or something you're pulling from somewhere, that's not customized. Everything we do when you start to get to know your clients and your training, it is so much about them. They might have a framework, but need the expertise and the help to really personalize and customize and blow it out. Yeah. And I think if you're giving, if you make the choice to give, be happy about it. And if you're finding that you're sharing and you feel awful, well, guess what? <laughs> then then you're sharing too much. Don't share. Whatever decision you make, you have to be happy about it and feel comfortable. I couldn't agree more. But I also think, uh, I think it was Chris Penn who says a lot, uh, you may have all the recipes, but if you're not a chef, you're not going to make the food quite as delightful exactly. and amazing as someone else, right? That's right. Oh, I like that. Yeah. So I know everyone's going to want to connect with you. It sounds like the best place to go is LinkedIn, but tell everybody where they can find you, you know, how to connect with you on LinkedIn. Well, I'll make sure we post again in the, in the YouTube show notes for this episode, we will have a link to your newsletter and to the AI beta test uh, so that you can find that there. But where do you want people to find you and connect with you? I do think LinkedIn is the best place. I'm, I'm always there. Or you can email me. I'm Deirdre at pureperformance.com with two m's.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, giving us all kinds of amazing tips on speaking. I know I'm going to go back and listen because you gave great advice. And I, I, like I said, I just really want to hone my craft. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It was great to chat with you.